Well, good evening, and welcome to the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum. I'm Tom Schwartz, director of the Hoover. Uh, today marks the 138th anniversary of Herbert Hoover's birth. It's also the 50th anniversary, if you haven't noticed, <laughs> of the opening, the public opening, of Mr. Hoover's Presidential Library Museum. With his good friend and former president, Harry Truman, Herbert Hoover spoke to an estimated crowd of 25,000 individuals representing farmers, laborers, businessmen, engineers, academics, mothers, children, and representatives of the Boys and Girl Scouts of America. Recounting his own childhood in West Branch and how it instilled the many life lessons that led to his later success, Hoover reminded the young people in the audience that the doors of opportunity are still open to you. Today, the durability of freedom is more secure in America than in any place in the world. May God bring you even more blessings. Ending on that high note, Hoover and Truman officially entered the front door of the building, which is now found in the museum galleries off the Waldorf Tower exhibit. A replica of Hoover's Oval Office, complete with his old desk and chair, were awaiting him. Being the first president to have a telephone on his desk, the original phone was also there. It, of course, was not operational. And now would be the time to silence your cell phones and electronic devices. <laughs> <laughs> the press photographers want a picture, wanted a picture of the two former presidents sitting at the desk. Hoover turned to Truman and said, Well, Mr. President, I suggest that you take my old chair. You were the last president. No, sir, Mr. President, Truman shot back. It's your chair, it's your day, it's your desk. I'm just here visiting the chief. Not to argue the point, Hoover took the chair of honor. Since that day, millions of Americans have pa passed through these doors, and tens of thousands of researchers have benefited from consulting the contents of the archival materials reflecting Hoover's public life and post-presidency. Just as kind of a, a, a point of curiosity, how many people here, if you'll s s raise your hand or stand, were here for the dedication 50 years ago? <laughs> Although the fourth presidential library museum to be added to the National Archives and Records Administration system of presidential libraries, Hoover begins the federal system that moves only forward in time. No previous presidents can be grandfathered in, and only current and future presidents may be added. What brings us here tonight is recognition of this unique distinction of being part of an American treasure, the Presidential Library Museum System. It currently consists of 13 institutions representing presidents from Herbert C. Hoover to George W. Bush. Throughout the 50th anniversary year, the staff at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum have been reflecting on our origins, how and why we were created, what is our mission, who is the public we serve. Moreover, we've also tried to anticipate the needs of the institution for the next 50 years and planning for the changes that will need to occur for us to remain successful in carrying out our mission. Tonight we'll focus on the presidency, why it plays such a, a, such a central role in our political life and culture. Tomorrow afternoon, I hope you will join us beginning at 1 p.m. in the same auditorium for panel discussions by distinguished citizens of West Branch, former Hoover Library Museum staff, and former library museum directors as they offer 50 years of reflections on the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's guest speaker, who's a familiar face to most of you. Richard Norton Smith began his career as a speechwriter for Massachusetts Senator Edward Brooke, and later Kansas Senator Robert Dole. His first major book was a biography of Thomas E. Dewey that was a finalist for the 1983 Pulitzer Prize. In the following year, Smith's study an Uncommon Man, The Triumph of Herbert Hoover, 
was released. Richard has also published The History of Harvard University, a biography of Chicago Tribune publisher Robert R. McCormick, The Presidency of George Washington, and is currently completing a biography of New York Governor and President Gerald Ford's Vice President, Nelson Rockefeller. As television created the genre of presidential historians, Richard Norton Smith was present at the creation and is one of the foremost authorities on the presidency. In part, he's the only presidential historian to have actually directed presidential libraries. Beginning with the Hoover, Smith was also, has also been director of the Eisenhower, Reagan, and Ford. He set up the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas before taking over as the founding director of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum in Springfield, Illinois. I might also add that Richard is one of the few presidential historians that actually visits the places associated with the president and leads uh, occasional tours. Uh, we have information uh, in the lobby of his upcoming tour. Um, they're delightful. I know people who have been on them and unlike many of these tours where people just lend their name to them, Richard is there 24-7. You'll have breakfast, lunch, dinner with him, and he will personally be, be guiding you uh, to all of the places. Um, also on the desk outside, there are membership brochures for the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Association. Uh, and I, if you're not a member, I encourage you to pick up one of those applications and take it with you and sign up because our, we couldn't do our programming without their support. It was in Springfield, Illinois, I had the pleasure of working closely with Richard for approximately three years. During his tenure at the Lincoln, nationally known authors such as David McCullough, David Gergen, Susan Eisenhower, David Brooks, and David Broder visited Springfield. Blockbuster temporary exhibits were typical. <coughs> Creative educational programs were initiated and exciting programming including historically themed theatrical productions were standard fare. I learned that Richard is fascinated with hurricanes and follows them on the weather channel whenever they occur. In many ways, hurricanes are an apt metaphor for Richard, who is himself a force of nature. When I took over as director of the Hoover, senior staff and citizens of the area kept referring to Richard's arrival as creating a line of demarcation from a quiet, archival-centered research library to a robust research library and expanded programs and, a redesigned, uh, and redesigned museum exhibits. Lines extending outside the building were often seen with new temporary exhibits, and Richard would appear on weekends, offering director tours to anyone who wanted them. The new exhibit galleries that Richard created are now 20 years old. He invited his friend, President Ronald Reagan, to come to West Branch to rededicate the expanded Hoover Presidential Library Museum. Once again, the same excitement that Presidents Hoover and Truman generated in 1962 was felt again with President Reagan's visit in 1992. It seemed appropriate to invite Richard back to West Branch for this 50th anniversary celebration to offer insights into the presidency, the central focus of this institution. He will also offer additional insights into his years as director at tomorrow's program. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a distinguished historian and our dear friend, Richard Norton Smith. Wow. Um, I don't mind the, his, the hurricane analogy, except that they are, as you know, hollow at the core. Uh, <laughs> that's the only the whole point, thing with which I would take issue. Um, thank you very much, Tom. Um, and, I, and I think probably on behalf of all of the, those who are here tonight and, and a lot who, uh, who are here with us in spirit only, I, let me start by expressing a gratitude of our own to the archivist, uh, David Ferriero, who uh, made a very wise choice, in my opinion, in uh, deciding 
on uh, Tim Walsh's uh, successor. Um, you're doing a great job. Um, of course, it is also true that Tom is too modest to tell you the secret of success in Illinois is to get out before the indictments. <laughs> <laughs> century ago, an Illinois governor who did not go to jail assured us that in his words, principled partisanship is the lifeblood of American democracy. Emphasis on principled. That is not all that Adlai Stevenson told us. Politicians often speak of giving the people good government, he remarked, but one can't really give good government to the people. Good government is not a gift. It is an achievement. It has a price. The price that must be paid in time and energy and mental sweat in order to understand and to inform others of our problems. The price of examining all sides of public issues. The price of subordinating your own immediate interest to the long-range welfare of the whole people. That's the price of good government. But the price of poor government is infinitely higher. People always want to talk about the future, uh, whether it's who's going to win in November or, or what they're going to do thereafter. And I always tell them I'm a historian, not a prophet. I have enough uh, trouble trying to make sense of the past without predicting the future. My hunch is, from what I think I know about the American experience, uh, is that things will have to get worse before they get better. On the other hand, they will get better. One way or the other, we or our children will pay the price of good government. We will validate the claim of our first president who said a democratical government must feel before it can see. That is what makes it slow to act, said George Washington, but the people will be right at last. Like many of you, I have been uh, pondering the subject of polarization, um, which is much in the news of late. No doubt each of you has your own definition for that term, which is synonymous with mindless partisanship and dysfunctional democracy. To be polarized is to be paralyzed, frozen in gridlock, defined by outside money and inside influence, debased by soundbite politics, gotcha journalism, and a stubborn refusal on the part of most elected officials to act seriously, even when confronted by a host of serious challenges. One is tempted to, uh, to ask, has there ever been a time, in fact, when our <coughs> politics were more savage or superficial? Historians like to think of themselves as being in the perspective business. I'm no exception. At its best, history enlarges our outlook by multiplying our experience. That said, it's also true we historians are sometimes criticized for loving the past so much that we live in it. When you consider the alternative is Bernie Madoff, Charlie Sheen, and any of the Kardashians, I'm not sure the past is such an undesirable place to live. David McCullough says it best, you can't be a full participant in our democracy if you don't know our history. An election campaign, needless to say, is a conversation we have with ourselves. Lately, it seems as if many Americans are barely on speaking terms with one another. Just as bad, millions of us have tuned out the conversation altogether. Some are tea partiers, some occupiers. Many more wear no label at all. This much, however, they have in common. They wonder if their vote counts if their voice is heard. As citizens of a republic, Americans have always defined government as self-government. If Herbert Hoover's life tells us anything, if his example of leadership inspires us to any conclusion, it is this, that democracy succeeds to the extent that it is organized from the ground up, not dictated from the top down. 
it is not hard to trace the, uh, this impulse to its source. Almost 400 years before the social networking of MySpace, and nearly as long before Ronald Reagan appropriated the city upon a hill for his own purposes, John Winthrop imagined a common identity for this nation of rugged individualists. In the process, he also defined the crowning paradox of American democracy. In the most famous sermon ever preached on these shores, Winthrop said, we must delight in each other, make each other's conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, having always before our eyes our commission and community. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are on us. These sentiments are as relevant to the YouTube nation as they once were to the Puritan Commonwealth. In recent years, our bonds of community have become frayed, Facebook notwithstanding. At times, it feels as if the city on a hill has given way to the religion of the marketplace, with CNBC, our virtual cathedral. As the laws of supply and demand crowded out the original commandments, we came to be assessed less for what we created than what we consumed. Forget e pluribus unum, out of many, one. In its place, a new mantra took hold. What's in it for me? May I suggest that we will never regain our political mojo until we begin to ask what's in it for us. Anyone who has studied the Constitutional Convention knows that it was a very near thing. And in the end, it was only um, a series of compromises grounded in a sense of common interest and need that created the first republic to last in 2,000 years. <coughs> The uh, argument waxed even harder when the delegates turned to the notion of executive authority. After all, this was a room full of men uh, who were bonded by their common opposition to what they saw as the abuse of centralized power. Uh, they had only recently overthrown a king. If any single idea united them, uh, it was that distrust. Benjamin Franklin um, <coughs> proposed a multiple executive. Uh, he wanted the president to consist of three people, um, sharing and obviously diluting presidential power. Um, James Wilson of Pennsylvania argued, by contrast, unity in the executive would be the best safeguard against tyranny. In the end, the delegates settled on such an executive, but only because blame would be more easily apportioned that way, <laughs> and because George Washington had already conclusively demonstrated that he could be trusted with a degree of power that would tempt lesser mortals to its abuse. Which brings us to what I call the paradox of polarization. To most of you, no doubt, the word is a pejorative, another name for systemic failure and a historical aberration to boot. In fact, it can be argued Polarization is a thread running throughout the American tapestry. For proof, you need to look no further than the four granite faces on Mount Rushmore, each revered as an American icon, right? Think again. If ever a nation was debauched by a man, the American nation has been debauched by Washington. If ever a nation was deceived by a man, the American nation has been deceived by Washington. That's how the Philadelphia Aurora the Washington Post of its day, described George Washington's legacy in the twilight of his presidency. Forget all the sugary tributes after the fact to Washington as one who unites all hearts. Long before he became a monument, chilly and featureless, Washington labored to unify a nation in name only, one whose divisions dwarf our own and whose partisan press anticipated today's most savage blogs. For his efforts, he was denounced as a dupe of King George, a betrayer of the revolution. His effigy was burned in the streets of Philadelphia. <coughs> Equally scorching were predictions made by Thomas Jefferson's opponents should the American electorate in 1800 be so misguided as to award the presidency to this free-thinking, French-speaking, French-eating infidel of Monticello. <laughs> Declared one Connecticut journal, quote, Unrestrained by law or the fear of punishment, 
neighbors will become enemies of neighbors, brothers of brothers, fathers of their sons, and sons of their fathers. Murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of distress, the soil soaked with blood, and the nation black with crimes. As objective political analysis, this is on a par with today's shrewish character assassinations on talk radio. It led Jefferson himself to declare the most trustworthy part of the daily newspaper to be the advertisements. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is Theodore Roosevelt, under whose egocentric leadership the administrative presidency of the 19th century became a position of unparalleled civic education and executive assertion. A master of the grand gesture, the man dubbed Theodore Rex was not notably self-effacing. <laughs> Henry Adams, son and grandson of American president, said of T.R. that he was never sober, quote, only is he is drunk with himself and not with rum. <laughs> T.R. had an opinion on everything and a child's delight in stating it. So he lectured his fellow citizens on the virtues of phonetic spelling and the pernicious theories of race suicide espoused by advocates of birth control. He denounced George Bernard Shaw as a blue rumped ape. Zara Nicholas II as a preposterous little creature, and revolutionary polemicist Thomas Paine as a filthy little atheist. <laughs> Domestic critics of his administration were flailed as, quote, circumcised skunks <laughs> and copper riveted idiots, while pacifists were contemptuously dismissed as flub dubs and molly coddles. Traditionalists decried the inventor of the bully pulpit as a bully in the pulpit. Mark Twain, Andrew Carnegie, and other uh, pillars of the anti-imperialist league thought him a jingo and a hemispheric disturber of the peace. Meanwhile, T.R. entertained fears of his own regarding political polarization. Listen to Teddy Roosevelt a century ago. It would be a dreadful calamity if we saw this country divided into two parties one containing the bulk of the property owners and conservative people, the other the bulk of the wage earners and the less prosperous people generally, each party insisting upon demanding much that was wrong, each party sullen and angered by real and fancied grievances. No American leader was more divisive than our 16th president, whose election in 1860 led to the breakup of the Union itself. Mr. Lincoln will go down to posterity as the man who could not read the signs of the time, declared the London Times in the autumn of 1864. A man who plunged his country into a great war without a plan, who failed without excuse, and who fell without a friend. Harsher still were the criticisms directed his way by Lincoln's war-weary countrymen. All this, needless to say, comes as a surprise to modern-day Americans many of whom assumed that Lincoln was born on Mount Rushmore, <laughs> if not in a manger. <laughs> How, they asked, could this most polarizing president of his time become, over time, the president against whom all others are measured? It's a question that each generation must answer for itself. How we answer it reveals as much about ourselves as it does about the leader whom Tolstoy called Christ in miniature. Less than three months from now, 140 million or so Americans will go to the polls to choose a new president. What tests will they apply? What criteria should they have in mind? The Constitution offers a little guidance. The only legal qualifications it spells out require that one must be 35 years of age or older, native born, and a resident within the United States for at least 14 years. That's it. Nowhere does our organic charter mention educational background, IQ, communication skills, administrative or legislative experience. Nor does it mention personal traits, such as judgment, compassion, conscience, or that all-purpose resume buster works well with others. <laughs> <laughs> These and a host of other factors are left to you the electorate to weigh, along with your personal ideological and policy preferences. 
Does history have anything to contribute as you ponder your decision? I'd like to think that it does. As a decidedly nonpartisan alternative to the 30 second spots, focus group sound bites, and horse race journalism that often passes for the making of the president 2012. If it's any consolation, negative campaigning has been around since the earliest days of the Republic, so has media bias. I've already mentioned the charges leveled by that Connecticut newspaper at Thomas Jefferson in 1800, then as now democracy was an equal opportunity abuser. So Jefferson's supporters spread the story that John Adams had married one of his sons to a daughter of King George III, the first step toward reuniting the United States with its mother country. For good measure, they portrayed the squat, charismatically challenged Adams as a lecherous old man who had dispatched a diplomat to England on a U.S. frigate to procure four mistresses, two for himself and two for George Washington. <laughs> Sex is a campaign perennial, though a poor leading indicator of presidential performance, at least in the Oval Office. <laughs> Consider Warren Gamaliel Harding. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a while. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, well, con consider Warren Gamaliel Harding. Nothing so became Harding's life as his leaving it. His messy death in a San Francisco hotel room in August 1923 led to journalistic speculation that his wife Florence had poisoned him. In the years since, a scholarly consensus has formed around the belief that she didn't, but should have. <laughs> Willa Cather wrote, the history of every country begins in the heart of a man or woman. This is not a view widely held in the modern classroom, where heroes, and for that matter villains, are out of fashion and narrative storytelling is often crowded out by statistical analysis. But of course it wasn't a statistic that wrote the Gettysburg Address, or charged up San Juan Hill, or told B. Karl Gorbachev to tear down this wall. Individuals matter. Individual leaders matter greatly. Does character matter? You bet it does never more so than when a president is committing young Americans to battle. But how then do you define character? Character, said Lincoln, is like a tree, and reputation like its shadow. The shadow is what we think of it, the tree is the real thing. Consider the tree of conviction. It goes without saying we want our presidents to be men and women of principle. No president was more principled than Herbert Hoover. Before his election in 1928, his name was synonymous with American generosity. The great humanitarian who fed a billion people in more than 50 countries. If, I often tell people, if you know nothing else about Herbert Hoover, know this. That in the course of one life, he saved more people than Hitler, Stalin, Mao, and Paul Pot together could murder. Not a bad epitaph. Yet as a depression era president, unable to adopt, adapt his Quaker conscience to a different kind of crisis, Hoover came to be seen as the heartless personification of capitalism. Of course the great irony is um, he himself said privately that the great trouble with capitalism was capitalists. They were too damn greedy. <laughs> to most Americans, he was a remote, grim-faced man in a blue, double-breasted suit. They saw none of his private anguish through the 16-hour days, engaged in endless conferences with economists, bankers, and other politicians. Hoover's hands shook as he lit one cigar after another. His hair turned white and he lost 25 pounds. Holding office at such a time, he said, was akin to being a repairman behind a dike. No sooner is one week plugged up than it is necessary to dash over 
and stop another that is broken out. There is no end to it. Through it all, he never lost faith in the principle of voluntary cooperation over government relief. A voluntary deed, said Hoover, is infinitely more precious to our national ideal and spirit than a thousandfold poured from the treasury. Here is the practical idealism built on the generosity of average Americans that during World War I had fed Belgium and motivated Hoover's countrymen to voluntarily observe Meatless Mondays and Wheatless Wednesdays in thrall to the slogan, Food Will Win the War. This was the idea that propelled Hoover to the presidency in 1929, only to become a political ball and chain, hobbling him when the voluntary ideal was overwhelmed by 25% unemployment and financial collapse. Neither Hoover nor his principles had changed. What had changed was the environment in which he went, and indeed the very definition of leadership. Overnight the rules changed. No longer was it enough for a president to be a skilled administrative or legislative strategist. In times of distress he must serve as empathizer in chief. All of us are products of our upbringing. I've often thought one of the stories that tells you volumes uh, about this man of few words was something he said in the oral history project that was done by this library back in the 60s. He, he remembered that he was 10 years old before he realized that he could do something for the sheer joy it gave without offending the Lord. Um, that tells you a lot about the price of conscience. There's a revealing story in 19, I think it was 31. It's hard to believe, but true story. Three children had managed to hitchhike from Detroit to Washington to get in to see the president. Their father had been thrown into jail on an auto theft charge. Spurious, but and they managed to get in to see the president. Which is pretty extraordinary uh, at any time. Can you imagine anyone trying that today? And, and the, the source of the story is Ted Jocelyn, the president's press secretary, who was there. Um, and Hoover whispered to the children. Um, and he was deeply moved, as he was always moved, by children and their plight. And um, when he had heard them out, um, he said there must be something very good about a man whose children believed in him so much and who made such an effort to come to see the president. And he said, I, I want you to have something to remember me by. And he reached into his desk and he took out something, gave it to each of the children. And he told them, run along now. Uh, when you get home, you'll find your dad waiting for you. And they rushed out of the Oval Office. And Ted Jocelyn, thinking like a press secretary, sees manna from heaven. Here is a perfect illustration of the Hoover he knows, but that the public has almost never seen. Hoover standing, hands in his pocket, as was a habit uh, under emotional distress, jingling coins, looking out the window, and he said in a strangled voice, get that father out of jail immediately. And, and Jocelyn said, can I give the story to the press? He said, absolutely not. He would not exploit those children or their family for his own political advantage. Now, on the one hand, as a human being, that's an extraordinarily <coughs> admirable approach. The question arises, and I don't have an answer, is it something that a president in the modern era can afford? The hero of World War I rode to the final rally of his 1932 
campaign <laughs> through crowds of angry New Yorkers chanting, we want bread. One man's idealist is another's ideologue. Principles matter, of course, don't get me wrong, but a successful president combines principle with pragmatism. Thomas Jefferson worshipped before the altar of strict constructionism, if no other altar, <clears throat> yet history reveres him for putting aside his deepest convictions about limited government when Louisiana came on the market. More precisely, his constitutional principles took a backseat to his continental vision of the United States. Most people, especially those who live west of the Mississippi, think it's a good thing they did. <laughs> to overrule one's deepest convictions does not at first blush sound like proof of individual character. History, however, suggests it is sometimes the essence of statecraft, especially when it means putting the national interest ahead of political safety. John Kennedy took a risk when he blockaded Cuba. Lyndon Johnson, when he stood before a joint session of Congress and declared, we shall overcome. Richard Nixon took a risk when he went to China. <coughs> Jimmy Carter, when he broke with the Camp David Accords. Ronald Reagan, when he refused to surrender his strategic defense initiative in the face of Soviet bluster. <coughs> Harry Truman certainly didn't lack for principles. He drew more than one line in the sand during the explosive years after World War II when NATO, the Truman Doctrine, and the Marshall Plan were improvised with the help of the so-called do-nothing 80th Congress. In firing General Douglas MacArthur, Truman upheld the principle of civilian rule over the military at no small cost to his own short-term popularity. Indeed, Truman might have been thinking of Lincoln when he defined a statesman as a politician who's been dead for 20 years. <laughs> Pretty shrewd observation for a failed haberdasher. That was one of the milder epithets affixed to the so-called little man from Missouri, of whom it was said, to air is Truman. <laughs> when he left office in 1953, he took with him some of the lowest popularity ratings ever recorded. For a while, he languished in near obscurity, only to be rediscovered and reassessed against the anguish of Vietnam and the betrayal of Watergate. Harry Truman came to be seen as the real deal. Witness his observation, I wonder how far Moses would have gone if he had taken a pole in Egypt. <laughs> All of which raises two questions that you, the voters, might reasonably put to any candidate for the nation's highest office. First, is there any principle more important to you than winning the election? <coughs> and second, do you know who you are? because the White House can be a terrible place to find out. <laughs> Calvin Coolidge knew himself, and this man of few words said volumes when he declared, it is a great advantage to a president and a major source of safety to the country for him to know that he is not a great man. <laughs> to most Americans in the 1920s, Herbert Hoover's predecessor was more than a character. He was character. The president's way of putting down political panhandlers was as distinctive as the broad A of his New England speech. When an Illinois congresswoman laid siege to the White House, hoping to secure a federal judgeship for a prominent Chicagoan of Polish descent, she arranged for a delegation of Polish Americans to lobby the president <coughs> in person. Ushered into the executive office, the group shuffled its feet uncomfortably as a stony-faced Coolidge stared at the floor. After what seemed like an eternity, the president at last broke his silence. Mighty fine carpet there. <laughs> his visitors smilingly nodded in concurrence. New one, said Coolidge. Cost a lot of money. His visitor's smiles widened. She wore out the old one trying to get you a judge. <laughs> End of interview. <laughs> it was after midnight on Friday, August 2nd, 1974, when Gerald and Betty Ford realized for the first time that their lives were about to be transformed forever. 
The Vice President of the United States had just learned of the existence of a so-called smoking gun in the White House tape recordings kept by Richard Nixon. Late that night, the Fords held hands and prayed for strength and wisdom. They repeated words Ford first learned in Sunday school half a century earlier, words he had turned to often in times of trial. The night, for example, when he learned his stepfather was not his birth father. And again, in World War II, as he faced death aboard a storm-tossed aircraft carrier in the vast, hostile Pacific. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, the Fords murmured. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. By any measure, Gerald Ford had good reason to pray in the summer of 1974, for the challenge confronting him was unprecedented in American history. On the surface, the new president had only the 25th Amendment to the Constitution to add to the support of Michigan's 5th Congressional District. As it turned out, this was not all he had. He had the trust of virtually everyone with whom he had come in contact during a quarter century on Capitol Hill. He had the faith and values instilled in him by a remarkable set of parents. He had his own integrity and unshakable optimism and a governing belief that most people are mostly good most of the time. He had, in short, the mandate of character, spelled out nowhere in the Constitution, yet essential to any government that is built on truthfulness and on trust. Gerald Ford, like Harry Truman and Calvin Coolidge, was grounded. He didn't require the presidency to be whole. And in the unlikely event he was ever attempted to forget that, he had Betty Ford to remind him. <laughs> a wonderful story, a true story. On the night of August 9th, 1974, um, 38 years ago tonight, um, the Fords didn't move into the White House. They went back to their modest ranch house in Alexandria, where they actually stayed for the next week, giving Julie and other members of the family a chance to pack up and, and move out. And that evening, as typical, Mrs. Ford was in the little postage stamp sized kitchen, um, slaving over a pan of lasagna. And at some point she said, Jerry, there's something wrong with this picture. You're president of the United States and I'm still cooking. <laughs> it was characteristic of uh, Gerald Ford that when faced with the most critical decision of his young presidency, he didn't take a poll, he said a prayer. The streets around the White House were deserted early in the morning of September 8, 1974, when Ford slipped across Lafayette Square to take communion at St. John's Church. Returning to the Oval Office, he signed the document immunizing his predecessor from prosecution for any Watergate-related offenses. He also accepted the resignation of his White House press secretary. The Nixon pardon unleashed a storm of anger reminiscent of the calls for impeachment touched off by Harry Truman's decision to fire General MacArthur. I fired MacArthur because he wouldn't respect the authority of the president, said Truman. I didn't fire him because he was a dumb son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Although he was. <laughs> Overnight, Ford's approval ratings dropped a record 22 points. His friend Tip O'Neill told him the pardon would cost him the 1976 election. Perhaps it did. Yet time has been generous to President Ford. Long before he died, he had the quiet satisfaction of knowing that most of his countrymen had come to rethink their immediate reaction to the pardon. Even among those who disagreed with his action, few questioned his motives. Thirty years, thirty-five years later, his legacy as a presidential healer seemed secure. Being grounded, then, re requires more than a sense of place. It requires a sense of self, and it often expresses itself in a sense of humor, which is nothing more than a synonym for a sense of proportion. Success in the presidency, Harry Truman said, required more than a backbone. It, 
it called for a funny bone as well. A man without the ability to laugh at himself would go mad in the Oval Office. For a politician, humor is both weapon and shield. It is a safety valve, a sure sign of mental health, the best antidote for that preening self-importance known as Potomac fever. <laughs> Humor can be blunt. It can also blunt the sharp edge of political animosity. Grover Cleveland had few friends on Capitol Hill, particularly in the talkative guild that calls itself the world's greatest deliberative <laughs> body. It is said that one night Cleveland was rudely awakened by his wife, who whispered that there were thieves in the house. No, my dear, he replied, thieves in the Senate, but not in the House. <laughs> <laughs> the first George Bush, no friend of the establishment press, one day revealed that the family spaniel Millie had given birth to puppies, which were at that very moment lying on top of the New York Times and Washington Post. <laughs> According to Bush, it was the first time in history that those newspapers have been used to stop leaks. <laughs> Humor can disarm as well as deflate. The oldest president, Ronald Reagan, delivered more age jokes than anyone since Jack Benny. To those critical of his administrative style, Reagan observed that the right hand of his administration didn't know what his far right hand was up to. In one breath, he could denounce the Soviet Union as an evil empire, and in the next, all but laugh it out of existence. So he defined a communist as someone who has read Marx and Lenin, and an anti-communist as someone who understands Marx and Lenin. <laughs> he loved to tell Gorbachev stories. The great irony is he, that he told them to Gorbachev. Um, it tells you something about the relationship that they had. Um, I remember hearing him talk about one of his favorites, which, uh, picture, if you can, a, a, a terribly long line uh, in Red Square outside a store uh, with, with chronically empty shelves, people waiting and waiting and waiting to buy basic consumer goods. And finally, someone in the line snaps. He's had it. He said, I can't take this anymore. It's all Gorbachev's fault. I'm going to go shoot Gorbachev. And he runs across, disappears over the horizon across Red Square. 24 hours later, the line has barely moved, and someone shouts out, hey, isn't that the guy who was going to shoot Gorbachev? They see this guy, first a little speck, and then he comes closer and closer, sure enough. And someone says, well, did you shoot Gorbachev? And he said, that line was twice as long. <laughs> It is a terrible thing, said Franklin Roosevelt, to look over your shoulder when you are trying to lead and find no one there. <coughs> FDR illustrates another facet of presidential character. To inspire confidence in others, you must have confidence in yourself. No one embodied this more than Roosevelt, the polio victim who refused to be victimized. He was hardly alone in facing and overcoming adversity. His cousin Theodore lost both his wife and his mother on the same terrible Valentine's Day. Lincoln struggled with poverty, death, and rejection at the polls. Even Ronald Reagan, famed for his sunny disposition, grew up the son of an alcoholic in a series of houses and apartments that were rarely lived in long enough to be called home. To the Reagans of Dixon, Illinois, Franklin D. Roosevelt was an icon, and his New Deal programs vehicles of hope, not least of all for Ron's father, Jack, who landed a job with the WPA. The future great communicator listened spellbound to the honey on toast baritone coming over the radio. I want to be a preacher president, said FDR, in conscious emulation of Teddy. By then, TR's famed bully pulpit was electronic, its congregation numbering in the millions. Contributing to FDR's success was a keen sense of timing and an instinctive grasp of the dangers of overexposure. You know, in 12 years, contrary to what you may have heard, Roosevelt delivered only 30 fireside chats. He understood something that I think maybe represents the greatest danger of all to the modern presidency, and that is the risk of 
overexposure. <coughs> Today, the White House stands ringed with satellite dishes, ready to beam every presidential utterance to a public that may or may not be eager to listen. Stop to think, though, how many television characters last more than a single season, let alone four or eight years? And yet, that is exactly what presidents have become in this era of the 24-7 news cycle. Virtual members of the family, or at least guests in our home, who are just as likely to wear out their welcome as the real thing. So what about 2012? If history is any guide, let me suggest the following. We ought to be looking for a principled pragmatist with a firm grip on the national interest and the confidence that comes from having been tested. He or she should be able to laugh at oneself and at the absurdities and inflated egos of public life. Like Jefferson and Truman, the next president should be able to adapt to the unforeseen. If not a visionary per se, he should have vision. In TR's robust formula, he should keep his feet on the ground and his eyes on the stars. He ought to like and care about his fellow creatures far more than the trappings of office. We can all breathe easier if a president knows who he is, where he comes from, and to where inevitably he will return. A president's conscience should be at least as acute as his reading of the polls. Ideally, he will pay attention to history without ever tailoring his actions to the fickle electorate of academics who comprise the ultimate electorate. Most of all, this paragon of leadership should be a gifted politician, able to manipulate men and events while disguising his mastery. For the presidency is first, foremost, and always a political job. Every face on Mount Rushmore, including that of George Washington, is the face of a political genius. One does not get to Mount Rushmore by traveling the path of least resistance. Everyone there understood the essential truth of democratic leadership, that there can be no authority without moral authority. Washington possessed it as if by divine right, Jefferson earned it through his pen, Andrew Jackson with his sword, Lincoln through his mystical attachment to Union, T.R. because he was born to pound a pulpit. The monuments on the mall in Washington celebrate this truism and the leaders who embody it, each of whom enlarged American democracy, each of whom was willing to accept short-term unpopularity in, yes, a polarized America in defense of long-term interests. Which brings us back to the president against whom all others are measured. The wartime leader who declared, the fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation was as elusive in his personality as in his politics. For Lincoln, life itself was a fiery trial one whose ultimate reward was the good opinion of his fellow citizens and the chance to be honorably remembered to the latest generation. Law may have been his livelihood, but politics was his life. To his friend Joshua Speed, the rising politician said in 1841 that he would be perfectly willing to die then and there. Quote, but I have an inexpressible desire to live, he added, at least till I can be assured that the world is a little better for my having lived in it. Another friend heard him confide White House aspirations almost as soon as the two met. He never rested in the race he had determined to run, wrote this Lincoln intimate long afterward. He was ever ready to be honored. He struggled incessantly for place. Yet even then, Lincoln's ambition was being purified through a growing involvement with the anti-slavery movement. The man who took the oath of office before the west front of the Capitol in March 1861 was scarcely recognizable to his Illinois cronies. Standing at last atop the summit of American politics, a divided soul confronting a disintegrating nation, Lincoln had a transcendent cause to ennoble his gamesmanship. 
Logic told him it was hypocritical for a nation that professed the love of liberty to keep millions of human beings in chains. Another kind of logic, the compelling logic of the battlefield, would bring him around to the view that a war over states' rights must ultimately be fought and could only be justified as a war for human rights. At a particularly dark moment in that war, Lincoln told us, the occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. I can think of no better yardstick with which to measure a president's character or gauge his legacy. Thus we ask ourselves, generation after generation, did the leader installed by our ballots rise to the occasion, to the difficulties as well as the opportunities that defined his years in office? Did the force of his personality and the power of his ideas affect the way Americans live, how they see themselves, how they relate to one another and to the rest of the world? Did he spend himself in causes larger than himself for purposes nobler than the Gallup poll? Did he make a significant difference, not just in his time, but for a long time to come? The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. We might all remember those words on election day, so might the next president. Thank you very much.